Welcome back to Rockford Reading Daily. We are continuing to read Hinterland, America's New Landscape of Class and Conflict by Phil A. Neal. We are about halfway through this book. We're on page 88, page 88 and on chapter two, which is entitled Silver and Ash. And we will finish this chapter on this episode. And once we finish this chapter on this episode, we'll end the episode, start a new chapter on the new episode. I want to please ask people to share this link to this episode on any social media platforms that you may use. We want to remind people that we put these episodes out on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, on Facebook, on YouTube, Pocket Cast, Anchor, anywhere audio is available, this podcast series is also available. And we've been doing these previously, or I've been doing these previously on as sort of a refresher on things that we've read up to this point in uh, the book Hinterland. And this book has been very, it's been probably one of the most different books that we've read in this podcast series. It's definitely one of the more different books that I've read in my last two and a half years of being involved, struggling against police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. Majority of things that I've, I've read have been about issues that exist in an urban setting. Rockford is an urban setting. We've been combating these issues in an urban setting. And so it has been very important for us to understand the environment in which we are existing in. However, these issues are not contained to urban settings. And so it's important as you begin to, as you begin to get the groundwork down for understanding your environment that you expand out to other people's environments because we are all interconnected and all of these issues feed off of one another and you can only you are only as knowledgeable about the issues that you face as you are about issues that other people face uh i hope that i I phrased that the right way so we've learned a lot about the issues that exist for people in rural west coast states and cities in this country we've learned about some of the political atmospheres that exist in those places. We've learned about some of the political groups that have emerged in those places. We've also learned about how deindustrialization has affected some of these rural places. One of the things that I, I, I usually refer back to when explaining the importance of reading certain books that we read, even though it may go back 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, is the impact that deindustrialization had on urban America and on black people specifically. And this is pointing out the effects that deindustrialization had on rural America as well. One of the things that I found enlightening is some of the statistics that they've given us about rural poverty compared to urban poverty and even within different races, how those things compare. One of, some of the other things I found very interesting is the the description of these areas. The, the author has done a good job of describing, describing these rural areas and bringing us into this world to, to invoke our empathy as we're, as we go on this journey with him. And I thought that that's been a very important thing. He's also done a good job of giving us social commentary, giving us statistical information, and also giving us some ideological commentary as well. And so those are all some of the just real brief surface level sort of takeaways that I have as we continue to read through Hinterland. So let's pick up where we left off on a previous episode. Kindness. One of the first times I remember camping along the Klamath was with my father and brother along a stretch of beach just past Wythepeck, a town of no more than five or six buildings overlooking the last merger of the major rivers before the Klamath spills into the sea. While my family was fishing downstream, I sat under a ragged blue tarp we strung between a few driftwood poles in the bed of our old F-150 4x4. Its body so dented, it was difficult to find a single stretch of smooth metal or unchipped paint on any of its surfaces. The entire thing was like a raised relief map of area itself. Snow pale painted ridges giving way to complex folds of rust and dripping dew. A knot of steel mirroring the knot of wood and stone from which the machine had received its many scars, hauling timber for our trailer's fireplace, pulling stumps and stones to clear our gardens, and of course, 
the innumerable times that truck bed had carried me, my brother, our cousins, and many other kin, if not by blood, then at least by mountain life. I was maybe 14 at the time. I looked up through the tears in the blue tarp to the deeper blue of summer sky beyond, and then to the dim outline of the sun behind the plastic, burning into my eyes with the dull, persistent light. I closed my eyes, and that sun was still there, scorched into my eyelids in the shape of a white circle, slowly tumbling. When I opened them again, I looked toward the cool shadows crossing that wide river, fat from all the other rivers poured into it. I watched the opposite shore where a family of black bears had been playing earlier, shaking the underbrush and splashing in the shallows. Soon another truck drove down from the main road, parking nearby. Two men got out, talking between each other in a language I didn't know. I waved and they waved back, yelling over in English, quote, Don't worry, if we wanted to shoot you, we would have done it from the truck, end quote. It was marginally disconcerting, but also reassuring, since the logic was sound. You could probably under someone you could probably murder someone here and get away with it, even if you weren't really trying that hard. The body wouldn't be found for weeks, months, maybe never. Maybe it would be picked at by bears and coyotes and wild boars, melted to dust by swarms of insects, eaten by the river until nothing was left. Out here, you could be utterly annihilated, your life gutted out of you until whatever you once were was reduced to a trackless waste, primal ooze sinking into water-smooth stones and knotted roots. Life here seems to twist seamlessly into death. It's not just the river and the forest that appear upside down, then, but every feature of time and geography. The sea reaches up into the mountains through salmon, sp through salmon spawns, hordes of glittering fish charging up clogged waterways, their flesh red, rotting from their bodies as every ounce of muscle and fat is burned to throw them headlong into that final, similar porous orgy of eggs and corpses. Their nitrogen-rich bodies fill the bellies of martens, eagles, and bears, ocean-born nutrients ultimately built into the shape of a forest. The inversion of land and sea also appears to turn time upside down, as giant armored sturgeons are pulled from the thaw leg like primordial sea monsters. Driving along the backward river, it often seems as though the ancient, green, clear water actually travels back in time its ripples disappearing toward that ever-vanishing eternal now, worshipped by the white baby boomer Buddhist in their southern Oregon temples. But rather than Buddha, we have Sasquatch, the giant's grim, furry body, a neonate symbol of our own evolution. Neonate, let me look that word up. Okay, so neonate. Noun, a newborn child or other animal. In medicine, an infant less than four weeks old. Okay, I know we had a few episodes there where we was running into some words and I was not getting the definitions for them. So I want to apologize for that. But we back on track. If we run into some words, I don't know the definition of. We got to we gotta get those definitions. Good habit to build. Okay, so let's pick back up where we left off. Like Santa Muerte, Sasquatch is simultaneously a deaf god and the aesthetic icon of a deeply material apocalypse, one that first saw this land washed in the blood of genocide, its very essence chewed apart in mines and mills, and, as if this were not enough, a second apocalypse then returning for the conquerors, their new life of work and wages torn from under them, poisons cast into their blood, the abandoned mines tainting the water and the cold forests unsettling the earth causing landslides and feeding fuel into the ever-growing seasons of drought and flame. Sasquatch watches over all of this, indifferent, a symbol of time disjointed, evolution running backwards. In those Chinese mountain temples, maybe some have prayed to a similar deity, that monkey king who wiped his name from the ledgers of reincarnation and single-handedly smashed the armies of heaven, maybe not a coincidence, as they themselves were fleeing a civil war led by a commander who sought to destroy the imperial heaven of the king and replace it with the kingdom of peasants. The Qing, I think that's the Qing, excuse me. But Sasquatch is not a god you can pray to, exactly. 
It is just a witness, a shadow of ourselves outside of time, watching. At night, along the river roads, each curve is enveloped in a startling blackness, tree limbs dipping down like lampreys. You pass sleeping hamlets and abandoned houses, the river below winding along its own black path. The starlight stretches across its ripples like fragile sinews, and out of the darkness you will see the statues appear gradually. The metal sculpture of Sasquatch and Happy Camp, the many icons of Burl and Hardwood, all rising from the darkness like pale corpses being lifted out of tar. Everything takes shape except for the eyes, which remain oil black, as if those unemployed sawyers had gouged the sockets all the way through to some other subterranean reality. Those eyes watch you pass, not judging, not pleading, not proclaiming new laws or founding new heavens beneath the fire and spruce. Sasquatch can't free us. We can't be saved or born again. The two men who had stopped by our campsite asked a series of questions to figure out where I was from and who we might know in common, the customs that compose order in most territories that exist marginally beyond the law. My uncle worked a few construction sites in Happy Camp in Orleans. They vaguely knew the name. Afterwards, they offered me some salmon, because they had too much, and invited me and my family to their Labor Day party down the beach. These small kindnesses are what remain when every other guarantee recedes. They pointed up the river, and I could see the distant, sun-blurred shapes of people moving there at the very horizon where stone met light. People approaching, maybe, or all of us sliding slowly toward them as if it were really the earth that moved and not the river, as if history were one gargantuan slide of soil, flesh, and shattered granite, massive enough that buried in its mist we see nothing but mud, blood, and bodies drowning in the lightless pressure. And yet, nonetheless, it is a flood of which we are a part, inhuman and human at once. You surface for a moment, and through the dirt, you can see that hatchet-edged horizon, the warm bodies moving freely in the light. And that brings us to the end of chapter two, and to, the be and to the beginning of chapter three, which is entitled The Iron City. But we will begin that on tomorrow's episode to try to start the next chapter on, on one one episode, or start the next chapter on a different episode. I've been trying to... This book is too big to keep all the chapters into one episode, but I would prefer to start chapters off with the starting of an episode. So we will do that here. So let's have a small reflection for the the last few pages that we just read in chapter. One of the themes that we've read regularly throughout this book is the theme of apocalypse or the theme of the end of the world. Uh, he speaks in... When speaking about these hinterland areas, a lot of time the author invokes this this imagery that the world has ended in these places, that the apocalypse has happened in these places, and that the people who are still there are sort of just going through the motions since these things have happened, that there has not been any any true help or assistance or any guidance for the people who are in these areas, that they've just been trying to essentially figure it out as they go along. And when invoking that theme, he does a very good job of, of describing and illustrating, I should say, does a good job of illustrating the landscape of these areas and illustrating the, the emotion and the desperation that exists in these areas and uh, the, the nihilism that exists in these areas. And a lot of it is, uh, a lot of this book is a a mixture of, of symbolism uh, along with philosophy. And we see here that the Sasquatch was the, the image that he was invoking for symbolism through these last couple of pages. And the, the sort of synonymous role that, that Sasquatch has with these certain areas, with these hinterland areas. And throughout this chapter, one of the things that I think stood, that stood out a lot was the, the symbolism or the imagery, the symbolism that he pointed out that existed with certain entities in this area. He got, he spoke about the symbolism of, of tweakers and the symbolism of some of these hidden temples that existed for, that have 
Chinese origins or, or have Chinese roots to them. He spoke about the symbolism of of the fires that that take place and that happen in these in these cities. In these cities, excuse me, that the symbolisms of the fires that take place in these areas. And the role that those fires have played in providing jobs to people and then also to changing the 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 landscape of these areas, these hinterland areas that he's bringing us in on, bringing us to. And this chapter, I believe one of the biggest things I pulled away from this chapter is the, the poverty. He touched on the poverty and that was very impactful to read about and the rates of poverty and the disproportionate amount of poverty that exists in these rural areas, which was something that up until this point I was unaware of or unconscious of, I should say. I think also he did a very good job uh, throughout this chapter of sort of pointing out how people in these rural areas are not viewed by liberals and by Democrats as, as people that their platforms are, are catering to or that their agendas are, are, are putting at the forefront or, or that their agendas have at the forefront. And I think that that has, has done a good job as well for me of, of an enlightening as to why the issues that exist in these rural areas and these hinterland areas are not publicized more and are not spoken about more and are not as interfused with some of the issues that exist in these urban areas. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to wrap this episode up. And then we will be back tomorrow with another episode of Rockford Reading Daily as we continue to read Hinterland, America's New Landscape of Class and Conflict. And I, again, I want to remind people that we put these episodes out on a daily basis to provide you the opportunity to begin or further your journey in the struggle against police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. I want to thank people who listen to this and give me the platform to be able to take in this new information to after initially taking in the, in the information to try to put, put up my own perspective on this information. It does. And I've said this before, but it does so much for me in, in helping me to be able to retain what I'm reading and also helping me be able to cross reference what I'm reading with other things that I've read before. And it helps to broaden my understanding of the literature that I'm reading. So I want to thank you for listening and taking the time to listen and we will be back tomorrow.